If one knows the Bushman, and one knows his history, one realizes that every man, almost from the beginning, had to be, whatever else his gifts were, as a painter, as a medicine man, as a craftsman, but he also had to know how to hunt. It was the essential equipment of every man. The preparation for it started in childhood, because the boy, as soon as he could walk and run, accompanied the hunters into the field. He was taught how to track, and this tracking had to be seen to be believed. The marks of the animals, of the insects, the flight of a bird, the influence of the wind on the movements of the game, the character of the animals, how they behaved in the morning, or in the noonday, or at night. All these things were important to the hunter, so that the n nature, in a sense, was the book. It was his Bible, and the main writing in the Bible was the spur. As important as hunting with bows and arrows and spears was snaring, and snaring was impossible without string. The Kalahari Desert grows in plenty, the wild Sansevera plant, and from this plant the bushman extracts the fibre for making a superb kind of string. I myself have seen Bushmen having a tug of war with the most slender form of rope and failing to pull it apart. A very important part of the setting of the snare itself was to find a track used by the lesser antelope like the steenbuck or the diker. <laughs>
Once the balances were exact, the loop of string was laid wide and loose and covered with sand so that no scent could alert the antelope. In theory, therefore, the moment the antelope's foot went into the hole and trod on the catches of dry wood, the bow would snap back, the loop would tighten, and there the animal would be for the having. To reinforce the faith they had in their snare, Ramon performed one of the oldest rituals in Africa. He threw the bones. It is a method and a means of consultation one finds all over Africa, and the Zulus have a special word for it. They call it opening the gates of distance. The bones were splendidly vindicated because in the night they had snared a lovely young steenbuck. The roasting took just on four hours. It's a process which depends on the kind of earth in which the animal is cooked. But four hours on this occasion was quite enough. Thank <laughs> you. 
The hunters were rewarded with a prize part of the kill, the liver. And this, of course, is not an inflexible habit, because very often, if they are near their shelters, the liver and the more tender parts of the game will go to the people, like the older people who need it most. When the moment for sharing came, it was extraordinary that there were hardly any priorities at all because everybody joined equally in the food. On one occasion in the desert, when I offered to do the cutting up for the Bushmen, as I used to do on many of my expeditions with black Africans, the Bushmen would look at me in astonishment and say, well, yes, if you want to, but why do anything so unnecessary? Because if one eats, all eat. If one has, everyone has. To me, the most impressive thing about all of this was that it was not merely the killing of an animal. It was not merely a question of food that was at stake, because the hunter, as in so many of these Stone Age things, had acquired a two-dimensional role. In the role of the here and now, he was a provider of food. But in the imagination, he was a provider of food for the spirit of the Bushman. He represented in the Bushman mind that in the human being which is in search of new meaning. This Stone Age artist depicted the fundamental dilemma of the Bushman in Africa. Much of the game he needed for survival tended to be physically enormous. And he was a small man, and he only had a small bow and arrow to match himself against all the power and glory of the animal kingdom of Africa. He knew that the arrow by itself wouldn't kill him. So he invented the poisoned arrow. The poison he uses here is essentially poison obtained from a grub that lives at the roots of a certain shrub. But in history, he used more complex poisons. Combined it with the poisons extracted from scorpions, from snakes, and particularly a most virulent kind of spider. Some thread is bound just behind the arrow where it matters most, and the poison is soaked into the string so that it should follow the arrow deep into the bloodstream of the animal, where, curiously enough, it doesn't affect the meat of the animal, but affects only the nervous system and gradually produces paralysis of the total body. <laughs>
The hunt proper couldn't begin until after a long casting about in the desert. They found a spoor fresh enough to indicate that the antelope were near. Every spur to them was as individual as a fingerprint to Scotland Yard, and in this regard, I was the uneducated one among them. I remember one day how they simply couldn't believe that I couldn't distinguish what I thought was a strange footmark near our camp, and they roared with laughter and said, it is the foot of your own cook. Do you mean to tell us you don't know it? They hit the animal they wanted, and the whole herd of superb gemsbuck, one of the most prized of all their antelopes, took flight. Everything depended now on how deep the arrow had gone and how quickly the poison was taking effect. It is interesting that the Bushman arrow is always made in three sections, so that should the animal try to get rid of the arrow by rubbing up against trees, the loose sections break away and the vital end of the arrow is left intact and deeply embedded. The silence they have to observe makes it imperative that they should speak only with their hands, pointing out the right spur, the wrong spur, the direction, the freshness, or the staleness, or the speed with which the animals are moving. Soon, uh, they had the wounded Gemsbuck in view. 
it too was using all it had inherited of life throughout the ages to face its last moment. It had retreated into a thorn bush, its head and those formidable horns of his to the front, the only direction from which the hunters could approach it. I myself have seen the skeletons of a lion and gems buck with the lion impaled on the horns of the gems buck. One of the greatest and most joyful of moments in Bushman life was the moment when the hunter brought meat home for all to share. One of the most highly developed things in the Bushman, in my experience, was their sense of intuition. And it was almost as if the women and the children who were way back at base knew precisely when the hunters were coming back with real meat, with the meat of one of the great antelopes of the Kalahari Desert. And uh, they would sometimes, even when one was not in sight of the camp, you heard a kind of chant and a kind of joy of dancing going up because everybody was going to have some meat. <laughs> Bushman Hunter told me once, ever since there have been Bushmen in the world, we have never killed one of these animals without saying thank you to it with a dance, for allowing itself to be killed so that we could live. 